So let's talk about our ground rules, how things are going to work today. Uh, please type your questions in the chat. William likes to keep the chat open, so the chat will be open the whole time, even during his presentations. Uh, he may very well stop in the middle of the presentation and answer your question, but he will uh, do his best to get to as many of your questions as possible. So the chat will be open the whole time. One and a half hours ACV REP credit, and we do have closed captioning. Take advantage of that if it will help you. Joining us today, William Freeman from APH, Tactile Technology Product Manager. Done a lot of these webinars on Braille displays and Braille Blaster and many other topics. So uh, thanks for joining us today, William. Thanks, Paul. Do any of these things sound familiar to you, challenges you might have? Maybe you need an introductory refreshable Braille display, one to get your students started. You don't want to, to get one that's too big. You want to get them started with one, and you're looking for, for a good option for that. The high cost of refreshable Braille displays uh, can be a burden. Sometimes people don't want to get them just for that reason. Sometimes the size of a display is a problem. You can't use a bigger display with 40 cells in small places and spaces. Ironically enough, sometimes you have students who don't want to get their Braille display out and use it. That's a, maybe a surprise to some, but it was to me, but we do have that situation that comes up. How do we best handle that? We'll talk about a lot of those challenges today, including ways to make Braille displays more fun for students. Let's talk about our learning objectives before we turn it over to William. So we're going to use talk about three unique features of the Braille Trail Reader, especially as it relates to the other displays that we offer from APH. We're going to compare the use of the Braille Trail Reader in two-handed and one-handed mode. We'll talk about how to sync the contents of the, of the Braille Trail Reader for mobile and desktop use, and examine three fun instructional activities to take back to your classrooms. So with that in mind, Let's turn it over to William. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Betsy Ann. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, this is Learning is Fun with the Braille Trail Reader. And uh, again, like we said, uh, we're going to keep the chat open. So, you know, as I'm going through this stuff, if you've got an anecdote related to the topic, if you've got a question, if you want to talk about something more, please, you know, put it in the chat. I'm going to do my best to follow the chat while I'm presenting. So I want to I want to make this as interactive as we can, and I definitely want to hear your thoughts about uh, you know the 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 things we're discussing today. If you've got an example of something you've done that's similar, or if you've done this exact thing before and it worked, or maybe there were challenges, uh, I would love to hear about those things. Uh, you know, while we're presenting today, so please uh, let's let's get the chat going. So first, we'll we'll have our agenda here. Um, we're gonna we're gonna start with some basic ideas. Uh, we're gonna just go over kind of the, the 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 principles of you know teaching braille literacy and how you can integrate a refreshable braille display into that process. Then we're gonna do a quick overview of the braille trail reader. Then and this is the 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 second half is my f my favorite part. You you want to save the good stuff for the end, and that's we're gonna be talking about. Uh, some free apps that you can utilize with your Braille Trail Reader. And we're also gonna be talking about some games and tasks that you can do um, with your Braille Trail Reader to help with Braille literacy. I love the combination of the words games and tasks. Games, very fun. Tasks, I don't know if that's fun. That doesn't sound, that doesn't sound fun. <laughs> but trust me, it's gonna be fun. All right, so let's get into the basic ideas. So, some traditional Braille literacy tasks. I mean, I think folks on this, you know, on this meeting today are going to know about these tasks, but I just want to cover them and address them. So, you know, there's tracking, uh, spelling, contractions. Uh, there's making sure you're using proper posture. There's making sure you're not scrubbing. There's making sure you can find the next line, and and all of that. And then the other one we have here on the on the slide is understanding. And so studies, studies indicate that 
generally, we're actually very good at teaching students Braille. Like we, we have high success rates when it comes to students that need Braille actually learning how to read Braille. Uh, where there are challenges is in understanding. It's in becoming a good reader just in, in general uh, that, there's, that there's, uh, there's disparities. And I think we're all familiar with these, with these challenges. You know, it's because, you know, part of it's Braille so complicated that you've got this other thing you've got to teach in addition to literacy. So there's all these skills, all the skills we just talked about briefly, you know, you've got to teach all those and you've got to teach someone how to be a good reader. And so it's just, it's too, it's too common for a student to fall behind while they're trying to pick up all these skills, they're gonna fall behind their peers who aren't having to learn Braille. Um, and, and then they're gonna, you know, they're gonna to struggle to become good readers. And so the, the way that I think, I think we combat that is by giving students as many opportunities as possible to, uh, to read Braille. Um, there's lots of, there's lots of studies that indicate, uh, you know, the younger someone learns Braille, the more likely they are to become a lifelong Braille reader. And also just, just the more you're exposed to Braille, the more comfortable you can become. And the same is true of print. Uh, the more you read print, the better of a, of a reader you will be. So, I mean, the, the same will be true for Braille. And then I think you do that through games and everyday reading. Now, the, the next slide is going to be about why use a refreshable Braille display. And it goes through some of the reasons why someone might want to use a refreshable Braille display to teach someone Braille literacy skills. But I want to make sure that we're very clear up front that, you know, I'm not suggesting that you should use a Braille display exclusively. Of course, you know, uh, studies indicate that paper and refreshable Braille, when combined, lead to similar positive outcomes when it comes to early braille literacy. There literally was a study on this and what they did, there's, you can't do a control group with students because that wouldn't be fair to the students. And so what they did was they alternated uh, between uh, paper braille for two weeks, braille display for two weeks, and then back and forth. And then they monitored their progress and um, it, it actually helped. It helped them with reading paper braille, it helped them with reading refreshable braille. And so there's no downside to making a Braille display a part of your toolkit. Uh, paper Braille obviously offers its own advantages, you know, like uh, teaching spatial relationships, uh, access to tactile graphics, and the inclusion of Braille formatting. Um, and let's, let's get into the advantages of uh, Braille displays. So why use a refreshable Braille display? You're gonna get crisp Braille that does not degrade over time. Another key thing to think about here is some folks uh, maybe don't have as much feeling in their fingertips. And so reading paper braille might actually be harder for them than reading refreshable braille. Um, you know, I think a good solution there is finding a good way to get them good paper braille, but a refreshable braille display might help you like, oh, they struggle well, really, they you know, struggle a lot with paper braille, but suddenly if I put a, a refreshable braille display in front of them, you know, they're either not struggling as much or suddenly they're starting to get it. That may be indication that maybe their their feeling and uh, sense in their fingertips isn't as strong. Uh, more impromptu learning is another reason. So this is really leaning into the refreshable part of the braille display. So you can you can uh, especially with all the braille displays that have onboard translation. You know it's easy enough to just take a print document and just get some braille that you can you can read. You know I think we all love transcribers. I'm a transcriber myself, uh, but there's not always there's not always time to get a transcriber to transcribe every single thing that you want to look at every day. Uh, immediate feedback. So you get immediate feedback. The student is able to interact uh, with you, with the work, and then they can have their work reviewed and then they can easily correct it. You know, they're not having to type something up or send it off and wait or emboss it or print it or whatever it is. They can, they can do the thing, hand you the Braille display. You can check it out. And, and then correct their mistakes, and then you can move on from there. Another one I think is that's good is the keys require less pressure to utilize than a brailler. Uh, so if you have multiple disabilities, if you have uh, 
physical disabilities that make it uh, difficult for you to, to apply that pressure on your brailler to create braille, you may benefit from a refreshable braille display. The, the keys are much more digital. You know, they're not, it's not a physical button really in the sense that you're having to actually press a lever that then makes braille. You're just pressing a little button that then, you know, works with software to create braille. The last two, uh, you know, are kind of intertwined, but that's uh, one is building a foundation for future learning and professional development. I think we can all agree that you're going to need to learn to use a refreshable braille display eventually. You know, it's it's a uh, you know it's the 21st century, and that's just it's a part of the toolkit now that you're going to need to eventually use a refreshable braille display. So the argument I would be making here is, you know, you might as well introduce it early and make it a part of building their braille literacy, uh, so that you can build on that foundation later. Another thing is combine with screen readers for auditory output. So you know, all the major screen readers are going to support. Braille displays in general, and the Braille Tro reader specifically. And so then you can combine the two. So you've got the Braille display um, for their Braille. You've got the, the auditory output to reinforce what they're learning. If they struggle at all, they can lean into the screen reader. The, 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 the downside here, of course, is how do you know when they're reading Braille versus when they're just relying on the screen reader? You know, uh, students are just like everyone else. They're gonna take the path of least resistance and if the path of least resistance is to just rely on the audio, um, that's, you know, that may be what they do. And that's not what we want. You know, audio is great. Screen readers are great. Um, uh, absolutely, screen readers are great. But we don't want students just relying on audio. We want them reading. We want them writing. Uh, we want them interacting with the world the same as their, their, their peers that are using print. Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't have a kid that can read print and say, "Oh, well, he's got audiobooks. We got him an Audible subscription. You know, we don't need to teach him how to read." Uh, and I, I think everybody here would obviously agree with with that idea that we've got to teach uh, folks how to read Braille. Um, the the disadvantages of the Braille display would be the the spatial understandings and one of the key skills that you teach with Braille literacy is finding your way to the next line. Now, obviously, with a Braille display, uh, right now, they're all single line. And so there's not going to be that having to find your way to the next line. But I can say I would suggest that this is actually a good thing, because it allows you to focus on those other skills. So instead of having to worry about finding your way to the next line and, and maintaining, you know, on the next line, you can just focus on one line at a time. It can be one less thing that the student has to worry about when they're doing that, that particular um, work. You know, they they get to work with their braille display, and when they're doing that, they're not having they're they're worrying about contractions, they're worrying about spelling, they're worrying about their posture and making sure they're they're not scrubbing and all those other things. And then they've got this extra thing that they don't have to think about, which is finding their way to the next line. They just are you know navigating forward and keeping their hands in the same position, and 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 all of that. So there's definitely there's advantages and there's disadvantages to braille displays, but I think combining them with paper is the way to go. Um, we've got our first poll question. So I think I'm going to supposed to read these out. So well, I, you can or I can. I'm, okay. so either no. way is fine. Go but, ahead, Paul. Um, you, all you, right. you take it. All right. And this is also a great time to throw your questions in the chat while these are going on. So first question, uh, which of these is not an advantage of paper braille? Which is not an advantage of paper braille? Is it spatial relationships? access to tactile graphics, combines with screen readers for auditory output or inclusion of braille formatting. One of those is not an advantage of, braille, of paper braille. Which one is it? And as Paul said, the chat is open. Feel free to drop any questions in there. I've also been dropping some links in. Yeah, Margarita said, I had to read it twice because I was thinking refreshable Braille. Yeah, so this poll question is about the advantages of paper Braille. Thanks for clarifying that. Oh, 
All right. Well, Yum, I think it, you're doing a great job so far. There's no questions yet. Um, yeah. We've had about 70% votes. So I'm going to share where we are so far. Which of these is not an advantage of paper Braille? Uh, our majority at 91% said it combines with screen readers for auditory output. Uh, so we might have tricked some of you guys on this. 8% said access to tactile graphics. 2% said teaching spatial relationships and inclusion of Braille formatting. Oh gosh, I made the same mistake that Marguerite did. I went in with my opposite brain on. So William, go ahead and, and clarify for all of us, uh, which was the correct answer, which is not an advantage of paper Braille. So that's combining, combines with screen readers for auditory output is the correct answer. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, that one was tricky. We worded it funny. Um, and we we got you. So a few of you. Um, but thank you guys for completing that poll. All right. And if you've got any questions, please feel free to uh, throw them in the chat. All right. So now we're going to do an overview of the Braille Trail Reader, the BTR, as it were. So up here on the screen, I have a picture of the Braille Trail Reader. It is a, uh, it's a really nice um, shade of red. It sort of reminds me of those uh, like radio flyer, uh, uh, little uh, cars you can pull, I can't remember, wagons that you can pull uh, for little kids. It reminds me of that. But it's got uh, eight Braille keys at the top. And they're, these are the Perkins style Braille keys and they're set up in an ergonomic way. Uh, you've got the six kind of in, you know, in the middle there for creating Braille. And then on the outer edges, you've got the dot seven and eight. And those are typically seven and eight. Seven's gonna be typically delete or cancel. Eight is typically gonna be enter or okay. And so you've got the, you've got the six to create Braille and then the seven and eight to interact. Uh, below that is, are these router keys. So you've got the router keys and then the Braille cells. And it's, uh, it's 14 traditional piezoelectric Braille cells. And then the router keys though, are actually, uh, they're really cool. They are unique touch router keys. So it's not a physical button that you have to press. It's a, uh, it's a little touch area. And so you don't even really have to put pressure. You just have to put your finger there very lightly. And then that indicates that you want to use the router key. And then below that's the space bar. And then on the front edge are the thumb keys for your forward and backward navigation. Uh, one very important thing that I don't want to uh, overlook is the analog stick. Uh, between uh, dots one and four, kind of above and between dots one and four at the top of the braille display is this little analog stick. And that is gonna be used for, it's gonna be used for navigation. It's a part of one-handed mode. It's a pretty multifunctionary uh, analog stick that you can use for okay and cancel and, and left and right. And it can do a whole lot without having to require a lot of movement. So it can be a useful way to use the display uh, without having to memorize any hotkeys or functionality or anything like that, and without needing to press it very, you know, press anything very hard or with a lot of force or anything like that. All right. Now we're going to look at the, this is the top left and side of the BTR. And so the things we want to point out here on the left side, uh, there is the power button. There's a little tactile marker on the power button so you can easily find it. And then there's also the charging port. It is a, just a, the traditional old micro USB charging port. And then on the top, this is really cool, is a switch. So there's a physical switch to move you from local to terminal mode. And so this will move you, you know, you can be in local mode, you can focus on the, you know, the apps that we're gonna cover in a bit. Uh, that you can use, including you know the note taking app, for example, um, in local mode. And then when you want to move over to terminal mode, you just flip the switch, and then that puts you in terminal mode. We think this, you know, I think this is a good. It's a good uh, feature of the BTR because it it makes it easy to not be distracted. 
to not be as distracted by, you know, am I in local mode? Am I in terminal mode? You're only in the mode that you're in and you've got a nice physical switch. You don't need to remember a hotkey. You don't need to find a menu item. It's just very easy, like boop, uh, switch over. Now I'm in terminal mode, switch back. Now I'm in local mode. The next thing we have here, so this is the software overview. So the, the BTR, it's what, uh, I heard a great term recently of hybrid braille displays. And so the BTR I think would be a part of that. It's not quite a note taker. It's not quite a traditional braille display that doesn't have any onboard apps. So uh, it does have onboard apps. It has a clock, it has a notes function, which is how you're gonna use the sync apps that we're gonna talk about later. And then it's got uh, a battery indicator and then uh, stopwatch and then connections, which is how you're going to manage uh, all the other devices you're connected to, and then settings. So there's not a ton of stuff as far as apps go, but I mean, you can create notes, you can read notes, and you can, you can do some other things with those, with those apps. So it's just enough stuff to like get things done. Um, the settings options, there's some cool unique settings for the BTR as well. So there's there's lots of little behavior settings you can set, like uh, you know what type of formatting indicators appear and things like that. There's also a lot of braille codes. So there's a lot of different braille codes you can utilize and also language options, you know, including Spanish. So you can do English, you can do Spanish, and then you can set up the according, the, uh, the related braille code. Now, the coolest thing here is one-handed mode. So when you're in one-handed mode, you only need one hand to, you know, obviously to operate the Braille display. And so basically what one-handed mode does is once you turn it on, it'll stay on until you turn it off. And what it does is it makes space bar the activation key. So let's say you want to type uh, a Braille character. Let's say you want to type an L in Braille. So to type L in Braille, you would normally press, uh, you know, dots one, two, three, all at the same time. Well, in one-handed mode, you can press them all at the same time, or you can press them one at a time. So I can actually go through and I can press dot one, and then dot two, and then dot three, and then I press space bar, and then that creates the L. So L's, you know, L's a fairly simple example. Uh, let's say you want to make a, a Z. A Z would be dots one, three, five and six, you know, that can be fairly complicated to make and not impossible to make with one hand traditionally, but it's going to be really hard to make with one hand traditionally. With one handed mode, again, you can just press each uh, dot uh, one at a time. So dots one, dots three, dots five, dots six, and then space. I mean, it could be good uh, when working with a student that's just learning Braille, it could be good to turn on one hand mode and give them a chance to examine the dots from that perspective, because it gets you to think about how that Braille uh, dot is created, you know, what dots make up each Braille uh, cell. Instead of thinking of it as a cohesive whole, you can think of the parts and maybe get a better understanding. If you want to make a space when you're in one handed mode, you actually press space space. So you press space, nothing happens. You press space again, that tells the BTR, oh, okay, he wants to make a space or she wants to make a space. And then it does so. Um, okay, good. So we got a comment how exciting and how they have a student that will be able to take advantage of this because they have trouble pressing uh, numerous keys. So yeah, I think, I think they could uh, definitely take advantage of this. If you wanna do a chord command, so chord commands are uh, where you know, it's typically how you interact with, with uh, Braille displays. It's the hotkeys for the Braille display. You'll do uh, space. So that's chord. That's where the word chord comes in is space. So you do space and then you do the keys themselves. So the, let's say it's space uh, plus L. So one, two, three. So you do space, one, two, three, space. And then that tells us chord uh, L. Somebody raised their hand in the chat uh, if you had a question or anything, uh, we can unmute you if you want to raise your hand again, or um, you can feel free to throw it into the chat, whatever works for you. Um, the, another cool thing about one hand mode, uh, before we move on, so when you turn it on, it stays on uh, until you turn it off. So when you turn off the BTR, 
the next time you turn it on, the next time you turn it on, the very first thing that'll pop up, it'll say one hand mode. So that way you'll know it's in one hand mode. You'll understand why it's expecting you to interact with it in a different way. And so that, that'll keep you aware because it can be like, I've, I've had mine in one hand mode and forgot and then thought like, oh no, what's, what's going on? Why can't I do anything? And then you remember, oh yeah, I forgot I, I put it in one hand mode. So. Since we haven't had um, our hand raiser put anything in the chat, I'm going to click allow to talk. And so Mary Beth, if you'd like to ask your question. And you're still on mute if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Okay. All right. Well, uh, if you think of it, go ahead and uh, you feel free to interrupt me. It's not a big deal. Or, uh, you know, again, you can throw it in the chat. You can unmute yourself, whatever works. So screen reader support. Uh, BTR works with ba basically every screen reader. So uh, VoiceOver on iOS and Mac. ChromeVox, uh, that's the screen reader for Chromebooks. Uh, JAWS, NVDA, and Supernova on Windows. TalkBack on Android. And VoiceView on Amazon devices. So just about every screen reader, every modern screen reader uh, works with uh, the BTR. Now, one of the other cool things uh, about the, the Braille Trail Reader is it has Braille, this Braille Trail file transfer tool. So you can plug your, your BTR into your PC and then very quickly move files back and forth. So I have a screenshot of it up uh, on the slide. And basically on the left, you'll have your PC files. On the right, you'll connect your Braille Trail Reader and you'll have your, your Braille Trail Reader files. And then it's a very easy, quick process to move files back and forth. This can be advantageous in the classroom because it can, you know, in just a matter of seconds, you can very quickly hand the student the worksheet or take the worksheet or whatever back from them. And it's a really good way to interact uh, back and forth uh, using this app. A similar app is Brilliant Sync. So the way Brilliant Sync works, this is an Android and iOS device. I should mention, before I move, get too far, the Braille Trail file transfer app is a Windows app, but the, uh, the Brilliant Sync app is a uh, Android iOS app and you go to the respective stores and get it. And then uh, you can just connect your Brilliant device to, and then you authorize one of your accounts. It works with uh, Gmail accounts, Outlook accounts, and uh, with the iOS uh, uh, cloud accounts. And then what you can do is you, once you authorize it, there's a little bit of a setup with each, each of the different ways you can, you can have it going. It will then sync your notes with your email. And so this can be a good way to keep track of things. Uh, my coworker, Joe, has a great uh, example of him using this in his real life of needing, he needed his insurance info. And luckily he, he didn't have his Braille trail reader on him, but he had used the sync app with it and he happened to be, you know, he was able to go into his email and access his notes from where he'd had his uh, insurance info. So that's just one way it can be used. It could also be used in the classroom. You could use it to sync uh, with say your teacher email and the student's uh, braille device. It'd be a good way to sync their notes back and forth with your email so that you can help keep track of what the student's doing and check, check in with them. How do, how, do, how to access it on the computer? Do we need an app or only Bluetooth? So for the uh, Braille Trail file transfer, you need the app. So you need the app and then um, you'll wanna do a, a USB connection to the device. For the Brilliant Sync, you just need uh, the, the Wi-Fi. So you'll have Wi-Fi on your phone You'll have the Wi-Fi on your Brilliant, or on your, excuse me, on your Braille Trail Reader. And then together that will keep them synced. 
Do you need IT to download Braille Trail Transfer if you do not have authorization to download drivers or software on the computer? That's a good question. And yes, you will need uh, IT to, to download that for you. You likely can download the, the Brilliant Sync on your own because that'll be on your, your personal phone, but you will need IT since it'll be on a Windows device. You'll need, uh, what is the app's name for the Windows computer? It's, it's just the Braille Trail File Transfer and you can find it through the APH shop page for the Braille Trail Reader. So if you just go to the, the, the shop page uh, at APH.org for the Braille Trail Reader, uh, we'll have a link there in the downloads for the Braille Trail file transfer software. Oh, thank you, Betsy Ann, for putting that link in the chat. No problem. So yeah, those are the apps and there's different ways you can use those. Does Braille Trail work seamlessly with Google Docs? Um, yes. As much as, as much as a Braille display can work seamlessly with any app made by Google <laughs> using their screen reader, yes. Um, I, I love Google. I have an Android phone. They don't have the best accessibility. And so when you're using Google Docs and a Braille trail, I'm assuming you're thinking with like a Chromebook or something like that. Uh, if you're using a Chromebook, it's going to be as good as any Braille display you can get. Uh, there are issues when it comes to uh, Chromebooks and accessibility, especially as it comes to Braille displays in general. Um, for one, you're going to want to, if you're using a Chromebook, you're going to want to primarily use the, the physical keyboard because um, the uh, Chromevox doesn't have great um, support for the, the Braille keyboard. So an example I heard of recently that ring, that is true is like, let's say you press C uh, with any braille display, doesn't matter. If you press C, you might get can, you might get the letter C, you might have nothing happen. And so, but if you're using the keyboard to navigate to, for your hotkeys, for your typing, and then you're using the braille trail reader for your uh, braille, that's gonna be perfect. But that's, that's a struggle that's kind of out of our hands uh, we're working as much as we can with um, with Google on their Braille accessibility, but there are there are issues on on their side there. So the next one: Does the test have to be in Braille on the phone or computer or not? And I think okay. they meant text. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, yes. Good question. So the file transfer um, app will will transfer the the text as is. But the Braille Trail Reader has onboard translation, so you can you can transfer over the text file. Uh, the Braille Trail Reader user will open the text file, and then it will get translated according to the Braille code that they've selected. Uh, will the read and write extension work? I'm not familiar with the read and write extension. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat and ask you, uh, Jody, to please email me. Oh, I just sent it to a, my, the panelists who all have my email already. So let me send it to all panelists and attendees. So there's my email in the chat. Um, if you could email me, please, uh, Jody, uh, about the read and write extension, I will look into that for you and get back to you about it. That's not something I'm familiar with and I'd be afraid to say the wrong thing. Were there any other questions before we jumped into uh, the various apps? that one can, can use? I'm loving all these questions. I think you got them all, William. All right. Oh, oh can you choose? Uh, yes, you can choose uncontracted Braille. And there's a hotkey to switch between contracted and uncontracted Braille. So it's easy enough, like, uh, you know, let's say you're, you're learning contracted Braille and you come to a word and you're, you're not quite sure, like, I, don't, I think I know that contraction. That happens to me. I mean, I've been a Braille transcriber for, for nine years and I still, I'll come across, especially some of the end of the word contractions, I'll come across them and like, I think that's shun, but it might be the other one. Uh, so you can switch to uncontracted and then read the full uncontracted word and then, okay, yeah, now I know. So yes, that is possible. All right, so keep your questions coming and we'll jump into these free apps that you can get. 
So the first one up is the Braille Buzz app. I don't know how many of uh, how many folks were able to get or try out. It's still available, the Braille Buzz device. But there's actually a device. It's called Braille Buzz, and it's shaped like a B, and it's super cute, and it's very cool, uh, and it's for teaching the Braille alphabet. Well, we made an app that does basically the same thing. And so the, the, the physical device has these little honeycomb keys. And when you press the honeycomb keys, you hear the letter and you hear, and it has on, on the device, it has the braille of the, of the letter. So A is dot one, for example. Um, and then you'll hear like A makes the sound Apple. And then it'll, it'll say that. And it does that for all the letters. Well, with the app, you want to pair it with a Braille display. And that Braille display could be the Braille Trail Reader. It's available for iOS and Android. And it has the same honeycomb keys. Now, now they have uh, print letters on them. And you can either use the touch screen to find them. Or, and this is the, I think this is the way you're really meant to use it, is you use that Perkins keyboard on your Braille display, you type in the letter, and then you get the feedback from the app of what you typed in. So if you press, you know, let's say you do M, you know, so you do one, three, and four. Yes, the BTR does have UEB and English US Braille. So yes, um, it does have those codes. Um, but you, you, you type out the braille and then you hear the letter and the sound that it makes. And it's a fun way for very young children to start learning braille with technology. And again, you know, you wouldn't want to rely on this for everything, but it's a great way to reinforce, uh, those, those same concepts that you're learning. And then of course, as you type the letter, it also will appear on the BTR braille display. So you'll get say, you know, you type M you'll get uh, the braille letter M on your braille display so you can feel it and then get an idea of how it's shaped. Really fun, cool way to, to learn braille uh, when you're very young. Now, another free app is Typer Online. So Typer Online is an accessible, uh, I'm sure folks here have heard of Talking Typer. So Talking Typer is one of the most popular apps that uh, APH has. Uh, we've had it for a really long time and it was time for an upgrade. And so even though Talking Typer is still available, you, you now can get Typer Online. It's a website and you just, it's been put in the chat, but it's typer.aphtech.org and it teaches typing skills. And if you pair it with a braille display, it can be a really great way to reinforce spelling and typing all together. So for the BTR, what you would do is you'd, you'd have your screen reader. So whatever screen reader you prefer. So is it JAWS on Windows? Is it NVDA? Is it uh, uh, TalkBack or with BrailleBack on Android? Is it uh, VoiceOver on iOS? Whatever it is, you use that Braille display. You use that with the BTR. You um, go to uh, this website and then you'll hear what you're meant to type. And then with either um, your computer keyboard or a Bluetooth keyboard, you'll type out the text and then you can check the Braille, check what you've typed uh, using the Braille display. So it's just a nice, easy way to integrate all those skills uh, together um, as, you, as you're learning. This next one is a really fun one. Uh, I mean, cross, it's crosswords. Well, it's now called crossword, but it is a way to do accessible crossword puzzles. And so this is very screen reader friendly. And it's again, this is in your browser and Betsy Ann just put it through the, the chat, but it's crossword.aphtech.org. And since it works with screen readers, it also will work with your braille display. So you can read the clues, you can input the answers all with your braille display. And we've, we've made a bunch of uh, fun uh, crossword puzzles that are geared toward young children uh, that you can try out. And then we've got some others that we were able to get donated. 
And then the other cool thing you can do here is you can make your own. And you can also, if you have access to any kind of subscription service or anything like that, that will let you use their crossword puzzles, you can integrate those back into the app. Uh, there's instructions on how to do it. Even if you don't wanna get that far with it, it can be a really good way um, to just use the free apps uh, that are the free uh, crossword puzzles that come on it. Uh, there's one for like state capitals. Uh, there's, there's lots of them uh, that you can try out as you're learning different things. You can use the crossword puzzles to reinforce, say, say you're learning state capitals, you're, you can reinforce that combine that with Braille, combine that with typing, combine that with screen reader usage, and you get that synergy, I hate that word, <laughs> but you get that synergy of learning all those things uh, at once. This next one, uh, I hope folks have uh, had a chance to try these and have utilized them, but these are the Nemeth and UEB math tutorials. So there's two links here. The first one for the UEB math is uebmath.aphtech.org. The next one is nemeth.aphtech.org. And so one teaches Nemeth math, the other teaches UEB math. And these are a great accessible resource that you can use through your browser. Uh, you know, again, whatever platform you're comfortable with. And there are tons, it, every lesson is structured the same way. The first set is information. So it's how you do the thing. So let's say you're on the very, very first lesson. The, you know, the very first lesson is about the number sign. So the very first part will show you examples of the number sign being used. It'll tell you the rules of why you use the number sign. And it doesn't, it doesn't get super advanced very quickly because I know folks that have known Braille for a long time will know that the number sign can get complicated real quick. <laughs> so we don't get super complicated right off the bat, but we just kind of explain how the number sign works. And then we give you examples and then you take the lessons and the lessons are great. And you'll use your keyboard with those and you'll six key in your answers. And then you'll have the Braille display there so you can read the Braille as you're typing it in. And it's a great way, you've got the first part where you're shown in print what to type. And if you're using a screen reader, we've done, this is all MathML and every modern screen reader will be able to read out that MathML to you. We also have a non-MathML mode if you're using an older screen reader that'll, that reads it out in print. So let's say it's two plus two, it'll read the word two and then the word plus, it won't put a plus sign, it'll read the word plus two. So you'll hear it and then you'll type out the braille and then we'll tell you if you're right or wrong. Uh, and then the next section is you're going to be given examples to read. And then, you know, this is on the honor system or working with your teacher. So you'll read the examples and then you'll check to see if you were right. And then the last section will have mistakes and your job is to find the mistakes and correct them. And then we'll tell you if you are, we'll tell you if you got it right or wrong. And it's, we tried our best to organize them by grade. So I don't think you are typically gonna want your student to you know, do the whole Nimeth tutorial from beginning to end, but maybe lesson one or lesson two or three or four, whatever it might be, whatever you're learning uh, that year or that semester in math class, you know, maybe you go ahead and just cover that with the student. And that way that can give them a quick foundation for the math skills you know, for the Braille skills, they're going to need to get through the math that they're learning uh, that year. Uh, and again, that's going to be, a, it's available in UEB and Nimeth. And we, we have updated the Nimeth tutorial to cover um, the changes that have, that have been brought about recently as Nimeth has been integrated into uh, UEB. So we, we use the code switch indicators and, and all of that. So I definitely highly recommend these and they are awesome to pair with a braille display uh, and be able to actually read the braille and, you know, practice those reading skills. The last thing we've got here for apps is Braille Blaster. I think if, if anybody here has ever been to a webinar with me uh, before, you know, you know me as the Braille Blaster guy, I'm always talking about Braille Blaster. 
and today is no exception. So Braille Blaster is a great tool for making quick, quality, everyday Braille. So you can just go to braillebluster.org or braillebluster.org slash download and get Braille Blaster for free. It's available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. We're having some issues with the latest uh, versions of Mac, but we're working on that. Uh, so if you have an older Mac, you'll be fine. If you're 90% of the world's population who uses Windows instead of Mac, you'll be fine. Um, and it's free and it supports UEB and Nimeth. Um, it's a great way to make Braille for your students. So we're gonna talk about some of the ways you can make Braille for your students, but a great way to make Braille for your students is using our math tools. So one of those math tools is the uh, ASCII Math Hub. You can use that to make Braille equations for your students. And you know you can make their homework, their math problems, whatever it might be, examples. You can make examples and it's a little hub and it teaches you how to do this thing called ASCII Math. And all ASCII Math is, is a way to type uh, math with just your keyboard. So the reason we had to come up with a solution is there's no times key, just to name one example, <laughs> there's no times key on the keyboard. So if you wanted to do two times two with your keyboard, you can't. Uh, well, with ASCII math, you can. It's two asterisk two, you know, which when you think about it, it is fairly intuitive, but then you've got the math hub to help reinforce that learning. So you go into the math hub, it's accessible. You can either use your keyboard to navigate or you can use your mouse to navigate. You build your equation using the examples and the symbols that we have there. And as you're building it, we're creating the ASCII math for you. So you see it and you learn how to make it. And then later you don't even need to use the math hub. You can just type it out. And a lot of them are really easy to remember. You know, like to make one half is one slash two. I think that's, you know, that's, that's one that I think anybody should be able to remember. One slash two is one half. That makes sense. One and one half, slightly more complicated, is one space one slash two. So to make one and one half, you just type one, you press space, and then you press one slash two. That's it. So that's a great way to make math. Another great way to make math is with the spatial math editor. So the spatial math editor is a tool we made just for TVIs. Anybody can use it, but we made it at the request of TVIs. And it's a great way within Braille Blaster to make uh, uh, vertical equations, uh, number lines and matrices. So this makes uh, quality spatial math and it does, it translates to proper Nimeth whether you're using ASCII math or the spatial math editor, you will get quality Nimeth. Uh, the one thing that we leave to the user on the Nimeth is the opening and closing Nimeth codes. So we've got two ways you can insert those Nimeth codes. You can either uh, insert them on the same line or insert them on the previous line, but we leave it up to you, but it's super easy you just highlight the text that needs to be inside your opening and closing Nimeth codes. Uh, and then you select the menu item and then it puts in those uh, Nimeth codes for you. So it's really easy to add it either to one item or a bunch of items all at once. So highly recommend Braille Blaster. And we're gonna talk more about how you can use Braille Blaster as we go over uh, these games. First, we have a poll question. All right. This should be an easier one, hopefully. It's a simple true or false question. Uh, the Braille Trail Reader supports Chromevox. True or false? The Braille Trail Reader supports Chromevox. True or false? This group is very quick with the polls, so thank you for that. And feel free, again, to drop your, your questions for William in the chat.
And I apologize earlier, I had dropped a link that said the handout for, will be available at the end of the week. The handout is actually available now, and there's two. So if you go to that APH.org forward slash educational hyphen resources, you're going to find um, two handouts. One is zipped because it's through Braille Blaster, so make sure you have downloaded that. But there you'll find information about all of the, the games and tasks that William has talked about so far, plus some resources for some games we'll talk about in just a moment. So 53% have voted. I'm going to share our results so far. Again, feel free to keep working on the poll or drop your response in the chat. But for the question true or false, Braille Trail Reader supports Chrome Vox. 83% said true, 17% said false. William, what's the correct answer? Oh, I can't hear you. The, thank you. The correct answer is true. Uh, Braille Trail Reader does support Chrome Vox. So yeah, most folks were correct. All right. So again, please uh, keep your questions coming. Uh, now we're gonna get into the games uh, portion of our uh, presentation. And I really would wanna hear your thoughts on these games. Uh, is there a downside that you see? Is there a way it can be improved? Is there a game that you've done that worked, you know, that you think worked well? Uh, anything, you know, uh, if you teach me, I can add that to my webinar and then I can help teach other people how to do that. So uh, I really do appreciate hearing anything anybody's got to add uh, to these uh, games that we're about to talk about. So the first one is, it's the tracking exercises. And this is why I had to put the word games and tasks. This is the task. And then you can still make it fun. Uh, you know, people call it like find the rabbit and things like that. But you can make quick tracking exercises using the Braille display. So you could either make a BRF ahead of time. And one of the uh, handouts uh, that you can download that uh, Betsy Ann was just talking about is just that. So it's a BRF that I made using Braille Blaster. It was super quick, super easy to make of some lines that were all, it was every, every single line was a, was a nothing but full cells within one cell was not a full cell. It was a half a cell. It was dots one, two, three. And so that's a really good way to start on your road to Braille literacy is just being able to identify like where that, you know, where that half cell is. And it's a good way to, because, and part of it is too, you're having to recognize, you know, the left side of the cell, you know, because that blank, that blank could technically belong to the right side of the cell or the left side of the cell. And so it's being able to recognize where that blank's coming in and, and how it relates to the whole, um, the whole line. And so that's one way. So you can make a BRF and then give it to the student on their Braille display. Or you can just type it out. So you could just take the Braille display, quickly type out, you know, full cell, full cell, full cell, half a cell, full cell, full cell, full cell, and so on. And then hand it back and say, okay, find the full cell or, you know, find the, the cell that's not a full cell in this example. And then you can work with them and change it dynamically as they improve or if they're struggling. And then, you know, the idea here is you start with very simple examples with like a half cell, and then you can start introducing the letters that they're learning. And the full cells actually, you know, will help when you're learning those letters, because when you're learning those letters, it's so good to have a full cell. That's why we have that dot locator for mention now in UEB. It's because having that full cell helps as a reference to tell, you know, is this a upper cell letter or a lower cell letter or a left side or a right side, you need that full cell to get that understanding. And so you can start very simple and you build up and you make it more complex and you can make it fun. You know, you could, you know, when you're finding the letter A, you know, say instead of finding the letter A, maybe you're finding an apple or, you know, whatever, whatever fun little thing you can say uh, to make it more interesting for the student. Or, you know, the, the letter K needs your help. Uh, see if you can find it in this field. 
uh, what age do you suggest introducing this device? Uh, that's a good question. And it's going to vary. It's going to vary depending on the student. You know, some students may respond. I saw, you know, at the beginning at our first poll, some folks were introducing Braille displays to, you know, children under five, you know, very young students. And I think there that can be appropriate. I think it can be appropriate to introduce a Braille display that young. You know, you want it to be, you want it to be monitored. You know, you definitely, you know, I think we all know this, but you definitely don't want to just hand them the Braille display with some Braille on it and say, good luck. Uh, they'll probably figure it out, but that's not the correct way, you know, to really foster that understanding. Uh, you want to work with them the same as you would work with them on paper Braille. So it'll vary depending on the student and, you know, their cognitive ability and their ability to, you know, pick up on things. But even if you introduce it briefly, you know, like just 30 minutes a week of, all right, let's play around with our Braille display and have some fun and play some games, uh, and, you know, point it out that way. That's one way to do it. One thing about the Braille Trail Reader, and I'll be honest about this, you know, 14 Braille cells, there are downsides for such, such a short Braille line. You know, I would not suggest getting a Braille Trail Reader and reading War and Peace on it. You know, I would not. Uh, but for little games and tasks and spelling words and writing quick notes and sending text messages and things of that nature, and light reading and a little bit of reading in the middle of the day, that sort of thing. Uh, the Braille Trail Reader is perfect for that. And it's it's small size and it's affordable price, I think contribute to it being a good Braille display for younger students. So as they're learning these short, you know, spelling words and playing games, and you could even think of it, it's not a Braille, uh, a Braille display for the student, it's a Braille display for the classroom. You know, so maybe this student, this particular student gets to work with it on this day, and then you give it to that student on the other day, and then they all get a chance to get familiar with Braille displays. They don't have to have their own. They don't have to be responsible for something that expensive, but it gives them a chance to start learning about it, getting familiar with it, and how to use it uh, as they're learning. So um, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked it. What is the price of the BTR? It is uh, $995 and it is available on quota. Uh, and we have a great, uh, great uh, comment here uh, that was sent through. Uh, After working with preschoolers for 17 years, I believe that adults often think young children can't learn technology. It's quite the opposite. They are sponges and soak it up. They love technology and they learn it as they age. Yes, and I absolutely agree. Uh, as you might imagine, the tactile technology product manager is biased towards technology. <laughs> so yes, I absolutely agree. Uh, young children love tech. And I think that's part of part of the push I'm trying to make here on this is about that love of tech that children naturally have. It seems like a toy. You know, when you give a kid an iPad, say, that seems like a toy to them. And it's, you've given them, you know, one of the most powerful computers <laughs> created in the history of the world. You know, when you look at the whole of all history and how powerful an iPad is compared to what, say, Isaac Newton had, which was nothing. Um, the, it's this fun toy that could get, you know, is more powerful than the computer that took us to the moon. Uh, and the same is true of the Braille Trail Reader. I mean, it's this powerful little device that looks like a fun toy and it gets them excited and you can keep it as a treat. It's like, oh, if you're good, you can use your your, uh, uh, your your Braille Trail reader, you know, keep it as a fun treat that they get to play around with. And I think that's a good way to incentivize uh, learning. Uh, another comment that came through was, uh, my granddaughter was watching and stealing passwords at four. And yes, <laughs> children, children are very adept at paying attention and just picking up on how to use things. And it, I think it contributes to how they learn languages so quickly. And so children, you know, can pick up a second language much quicker than an adult, which is another reason I think we need to teach Braille uh, to children as young as possible. You know, even if they still have a fair amount of vision, if you're worried or if di the diagnosis looks like they're going to need Braille in their lifetime, you know, the earlier you can start getting them to learn Braille, uh, the better. So the next game we've got here is called Monster Maker. So just the, the quick shorthand, I'll just cut to the chase here. This is basically like Hangman, if anybody's ever played Hangman, 
it, the, the difference is it's not extremely offensive and weird you, you know hangman is kind of a weird game and i played it as a kid and i can't believe that we, we've had it as a game for as long as we've had you know like guess the word before we hang this man until he's dead um so instead i'm proposing that we can play monster maker so it's exactly like hangman except instead of drawing the little stick figure on the gallows um you instead uh can draw or describe a monster and make it fun you know you don't want to make it too scary if monsters aren't appropriate for the student you know maybe you you can describe something else like a gross lunch you know, here's a gross lunch, uh, gross lunch maker. Doesn't have the, quite the same ring to it. I feel but, like you, know, you could make a fairy and give her wings and a tutu and a tiara and a fairy yeah. wand, you know. The one thing is you don't Build want the scene. You don't want the thing you're making to be desirable because they're trying, <gasps> because remember the punishment is when you don't <laughs> guess properly, another thing gets drawn. So Good one. yeah, so as you're drawing, like say the monster, you can describe the teeth or the horns, or it's got wings or claws. And, you know, make it fun. Don't scare the kid. Uh, play around with them, laugh, and make sure they know it's just a game. And it's a great way to teach spelling and vocab. And the student can type out their guesses. So, you know, they're going to want to just say B, but say, no, no, type out B. And so get them to type out their guesses. And if they're old enough, uh, to understand it, you know, get them to to keep track of their own guesses. So this will get them used to working within like a notes app. So on one line, you want them typing out their guess. So let's say their guess is B. Um, and then on the, on the next line, you want them to keep track of all the letters they've already guessed. And then that's a good way for them to get used to navigating within a document. Um, the other cool thing here by using a monster or a fantasy creature is it gives you some flexibility of when the game is over. So if the students, you know, if they're, if they're suffering, you know, uh, struggling a little bit, then you can just, add, you can just add parts to the monster. You know, there's no agreed end to the monster. Um, something, so yeah, some great, great uh, suggestions in the chat of, uh, you know, you can make a gross lunch. Uh, you could make a Lindbergh, you know, a, a gross lunch would be very good Lindberger cheese, pastrami, horseradish, blue cheese, and pimento. So yeah, I mean, that's a really great suggestion. And make, a, you know, make a nasty sandwich. Uh, there's a tire on this sandwich. And, you know, and the kids can have fun and laugh and not really think about how they're learning. Some good monsters two uh coming in through the chat uh shark you could make and describe a shark a t-rex a raptor that is a great example you know if they're learning about dinosaurs if they're learning about animals you can incorporate that into the game and you know it it's a real you know you start describing the fin and the teeth and yeah that could be really fun the gills um they're uh, kind of scale leather like skin they have that can be really fun um, so yeah, these are all great suggestions. Uh, and yeah, it's a fun game. It's, I think it's a lot less offensive than hangman and a good way to uh, teach that spelling and vocab while, while having fun. <laughs> I, I like that, uh, in the chat rats of uncommon size <laughs> and then uh, princess bride. And, uh, uh, yeah, that's a princess bride reference. That's good. So the this next one is uh mad libs so mad libs of course is a copy copyrighted term but it's a good shorthand for what we're talking about which is you know creating a numbered list for you know of like noun and adjective verb friend's name your name teacher's name you know whatever it is however advanced you want to get with the student create that list in braille uh, one of the handouts is just such a list. It was prepared by Betsy Ann and then transcribed by me. And so you, you can take the list, give it to your student on their Braille display. They can go through, they can interact, you know, with the list, add their words, take it back. One of the other handouts is the Mad Lib itself. Just fill in uh, their answers and then you give it to them. Uh, 
on their braille display to read and read it together, you know? And if, you, if you've got a group of kids, maybe, you know, the first kid reads a line or reads a sentence and then the next kid reads a line or a sentence. And, you know, while they're reading it and they're laughing, you know, they don't really realize it, but they're laughing because of how much they know. They know enough about reading. They know enough about words and how words work, you know, to know, for example, that you don't put a banana on your hands. You know, like they know enough uh, to know that uh, you don't wear cars as shoes or whatever, whatever the, the kooky example the Mad Lib produces might be. Uh, they know enough to, to think it's funny and they won't even realize that they're learning uh, when they read about these things and laugh. And another thing you can do that's related to this. So Mad Libs are actually, they're a variation on this thing. I didn't, I hadn't heard about this. I don't know if other folks know about this and I'm like the last person to find out but they're, it's called close reading, uh, C-L-O-Z-E reading. And the idea is you can take a passage. So you can take any passage and you just remove every, let's say you remove every fifth word. So you don't focus on the verbs or uh, adjectives or anything like that. You just remove uh, every fifth word. And then you give that handout to the student with those blanks. And you have the student guess what word goes in each blank and it you know it can be challenging especially if you just do it uh, so randomly by just picking every fifth word so you don't know what words are going to be removed but it can be good and fun even if they're wrong if they get close if they get the right idea like yes it could have been that word you are on the right track uh, it can be a good way to reinforce learning and it's like a little puzzle and an investigation that they can do and Mad Libs are a funny, you know, kind of kooky example of closed reading. Uh, so I, I recommend uh, folks try it uh, with their students. And I think a Braille display is perfect for this because it gives you that immediate interaction that you can do. You know, you're not having to, to fool around. You can just, here's the, here's the file on your Braille display, try it out, hand it back to me. I'll put in your answers. Here's some Braille, try it out. And then you, you're reading and you're just, you're off to the races. And it's a, a good way to get reading uh, Braille quickly. Yeah. So yeah, close reading is also when you give outline, give an outline and students fill in missing notes uh, during a lecture. Oh, I didn't, I did not know that. So thank you for that note uh, through the chat there. All right. Was there any, before we get to this poll question, was there anything else about the Mad Libs uh, before we move on to the next thing? All right, and feel free to throw it in the chat while we get to this next poll question. And this is about playing games on your display. So playing games can introduce or reinforce the following skills, which is correct. Tracking, understanding, finger positioning, posture, spelling, contractions, editing, or all of the above. Playing games on a refreshable Braille display can introduce or can reinforce the following. Would it be tracking, understanding, finger positioning, posture, spelling, contractions, editing, or all of the above? As you answer that, Obviously, feel free to keep adding your questions in. There have been some really good questions today. Thank you for all of that. Keep them and, coming. And great comments, too. Really, really appreciate all the comments. All right, about 65% have voted in our poll. So feel free to keep putting your responses there or in the chat. But for the question, playing games on refreshable braille displays can introduce or reinforce the following skills. 98% of our audience said all of the above skills, tracking, understanding, 
finger positioning, posture, spelling, contractions, and editing. William, what was the correct response? All of the above. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks, you all. All right. So the next thing, and of course, of course, uh, I'm going to talk about this. The, the, the next thing here is everyday reading with Braille Blaster. So we've talked about Braille Blaster already. Uh, and, you know, the things, you know, the ways you can make math uh, using Braille Blaster. Another great suggestion uh, I would like to, uh, that I would like to talk about with Braille Blaster is uh, taking web pages. So let's say you've got a student that's really into space travel, say, or dinosaurs or anything like that. There's so many articles uh, nowadays about space travel uh, that it's an example I always think of. But go find those news articles. So, you know, go to your favorite news source, uh, you know, challenge the student. You know, it doesn't have to be a kid's news source. You can get, you know, uh, you know, a uh, more advanced news source for them and find an article about something they like, something they care about. You can just go to that web page, save it. Uh, so uh, on Windows, you can save a web page just by right clicking or by using the context menu key on your keyboard. And then just going down to save as, and that will save the website as an HTML file. And then you can open that HTML file in Braille Blaster. Uh, it'll open up, you'll get most of the formatting will we'll stay, you'll have your headings, your lists, your paragraphs, all that'll be there. Uh, and then just do some light editing. You know, I would suggest removing any ads or unnecessary links. I mean, the, the internet is filled with enough ads <laughs> and unnecessary links. There's no sense in uh, transcribing those into Braille. So go ahead and remove them and just have the short article uh, and then give that to the student on their Braille display. And just like that, you know, you've got a great way to get them reading uh, Braille every single day. Um, got, had a question come through the chat. This is a good question. Can you pair the BTR with Bookshare downloads? So you cannot. Um, the, the Chameleon and the Mantis, which are both APH Braille displays, those both have Bookshare apps. So if you have a Bookshare account, you can sign into your Bookshare account and then download the books directly using that app. Uh, BTR does not. With the BTR, you can get your Bookshare files and you can put them, you know, the supported files types onto the BTR, uh, but you, you don't have that integrated app. But with Braille Blaster, you can still get that everyday reading. So you can get the news articles. You can go to Project Gutenberg. Uh, I don't know how many folks have heard of uh, Project Gutenberg, but you can go to gutenberg.org and that is a, it's a wonderful website that is filled with uh, thousands of uh, public domain novels. And they are available. One of the file types you can get with these public domain novels is EPUB. So just go to gutenberg.org, find a book. Uh, an example I use all the time is Moby Dick, but you could do uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. You can do Crime and Punishment, whatever it might be open it in Braille Blaster, and within seconds, you've got a Braille translation that you can put on any Braille display uh, that supports, uh, you know, that has an editor or a library or a reader. Um, but with the everyday articles, to get back to that first point, with the everyday articles, you're going to want to get them articles every single day. Like, that's the thing. Go out and just grab an article, throw it on Braille Blaster, save a BRF, put it on their Braille display. And just like that, you've got them reading every single day. You know, one of the things that got me into reading and I think made me the reader that I am today was I had a teacher that she were, we were required to read a newspaper article every single day and write, I think we had to write like three paragraphs about it. And, you know, they could be short paragraphs, but we had to just do a quick summary of what we read. And it was a really great way to make sure um, uh, to make sure that we were able able to uh, to read and to increase our vocabulary and to understand what we had read. And so, doing that with Braille, you can reinforce all those skills. And we're having problems with the the link for the handouts. Great, right, I'm dropping a new link in. Let's see if this works. 
All right. Thanks for that. All right. Are there any questions about what we've talked about? Um, okay, we'll, we will look into that on that um, handout document to see what's happening with the links. All right. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions about what we've talked about so far today? All right. So discoveries. And yes, this is being recorded. Yeah, it is. And it will be give it about seven days before it's out on YouTube, give or take a day or so. About seven days and it will be out there for you to re-listen to. So what have we discovered today? Uh, the BTR, it's small, it's lightweight. It's easy to move from class to class, from home to school. Very portable, easy to take with you, one of its greatest advantages. Games are fun, positive way to introduce and also to reinforce any number of Braille literacy skills. Uh, there are, uh, as much as there may be issues with Chromevox itself, BTR does work well with Google solutions like Chromevox. And also moving content to and from the Braille display is simple and straightforward with the Notes app and other things that we've shown you. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that came through the chat is uh, using uh, jokes and riddles as short, fun passages to be read. And that's, that's a really great idea. Uh, so you could uh, just quickly translate a joke or a riddle, uh, put it on the Braille display, and then get the student reading the Braille. And then they'll, you know, they'll laugh at the joke or try to figure out the, uh, the riddle. Um, one funny thing here, uh, I recently they've uncovered, uh, they've, there's a website. I don't have the link, I'm sorry, but you could probably find it. And it's a bunch of jokes from ancient Rome and they're some of the worst jokes you'll ever read in your entire life. Like they're not funny. They're not funny at all. Uh, they're almost funny in how not funny they are. And it made me realize that the Romans for all that they accomplished, the ancient Romans, uh, they weren't, they weren't that bright, <laughs> you know, like overall when, when you don't have modern education and all the, all the advantages that we have today, uh, you laugh at some pretty stupid things, <laughs> but those would be fun. If, especially if you had a student that was into history, you could give them some uh, Roman jokes. How many cells on the BTR? Uh, it is 14 uh, piezoelectric braille cells. So you get those nice traditional um, long, you know, long running, long working uh, um, braille cells. When typing in the notes app on the BTR, if the student types braille incorrectly, how do you back up to just that cell to correct without having to erase the whole word or sentence? line um that is a good question and i mean I, you should be able to just press delete um it when your cursor's on the word it should uncontract it and then let you just delete that one word you shouldn't have to delete the whole line if you want to reach out to my email we can talk about that and then i can try that i just sent my email through the chat wfreeman at aph.org and I'll try that on my uh, BTR and work with you and we'll try to figure out what's going on on yours and, and what we can do um, to get that worked, worked out. All right, some other questions. Um, does it do live transcribing of what is on the computer? Yes, so that's part of working with, uh, with screen readers. So the screen reader will, the screen reader handles the Braille translation. So JAWS, NVDA, uh, VoiceOver, ChromeVox. If you're on Android, you're going to need to get, so the onboard Android is TalkBack. That's the screen reader. TalkBack needs you to then also go out and grab, it's called BrailleBack and it's free, but BrailleBack will handle the Braille. And so when you've got your screen reader, that'll give you the Braille and then that'll reinforce uh, what they're reading. Um, 
So most schools in my area use Chromebooks and I have my students using iPads for more accessibility options. Um, should intro to BTR happen for both options as I work with new Braille uh, readers ages in kindergarten and first grade? I think yes. And iPads have the best, I mean, yeah, iPad has the best accessibility. So voiceover is the best screen reader, especially on uh, iPads and iPhones. I don't know why, but voiceover is not as good on Mac. Like it's fine. It does a good job, but the controls aren't as, they don't, it doesn't seem to control as well. Maybe that's just me. Uh, but on iPad and iPhone, voiceover is the top of the line. Uh, and I, I, I look forward to the day when every screen reader is that good. Part of the way iPads are so good though, is it's the, it's the Apple ecosystem. So Apple you know, they're kind of, they control everything. Uh, so they control what gets on their device. And it's that control that allows their Braille display to be so good. Uh, Windows and Android are kind of the wild west. Anybody can make a Windows app. Anybody can make an Android app. Like you, you it's, you can, you know, they, they still have a verification process on Android, but I think it's much easier to get past Android's verification process than it is to get past Apple's verification process. And so I think getting them familiar with Braille displays and using them with screen readers is good. The, the one risk of using something like Chromevox or Android a lot is it could frustrate them uh, because they're not as good. Uh, like, Talkback and Brailleback are fine generally, but when you start using them with different apps, that's when you'll start to see all the holes and all the problems that they can have. Uh, so you definitely want to control it. You want to limit it. You want to make sure you're there with them so they don't get too frustrated. It's not going to be as seamless as it is with, uh, with iPads, but it's still very, very handy. Is there a way to organize and order notes either that are written on the BTR or notes imported from another device? Um, the notes, the notes folder is a lot more basic than the folders you're going to find on like, uh, the chameleon or the mantis. Um, so you can organize your notes, but it's not going to be to that same extent of having like folders and subfolders and all of that on your uh, BTR. And yes, if you have a hardware issue with your BTR, please, uh, contact APH customer service. Okay. Yeah. Betsy Ann's already covered that and they will take care of you for any repairs or replacements. Oh, somebody found the collection of ancient Roman jokes. Thank you for that. They're they're great. Uh, my wife and I, we laughed more about the jokes themselves than the actual punchlines. Um, just because it was kind of fun because you, you hear so much about Rome and all the great things they did. It's funny to imagine that they wouldn't be that funny. All right. So yeah, this has been... Uh, Learning is fun with the Braille Trail Reader. And now we're gonna get into our next steps. So were you gonna handle this one, Paul, or should I go ahead and? You can, and then I can take it, take the last okay. slides. So next steps. For more information, contact Jim Sullivan. That's at jsullivan at aph.org. And he gave his phone number as well, 502-899-2215. So you can reach out to Jim Sullivan if you'd like to get a BTR or if you have any other questions. Uh, thank you, Betsy Ann, for putting that in the chat. Also, I would ask you to contact me, William Freeman. And again, it's wfreeman at aph.org. I would love to hear your Braille display and Braille literacy success stories, uh, your challenges, and any game and activity ideas. We got some today through the chat, but I would love to hear them, uh, you know, more of them. And so please reach out and email me. Now we'll turn it over to Paul. All right, thank you. So just a couple of things to let people know about that uh, we've been trying to let folks know about at the end of all of our webinars. Uh, there is coming up in May the, the 2021 National Coding Symposium. And it is sponsored by, or I guess put on by the APH Connect Center, as well as the California School for the Blind. It is a free virtual coding symposium and it's going to be happening from Tuesday, May the 11th through Friday, May the 14th. To get more information about it and to register, you would go to aphconnectcenter.org forward slash coding. Get all your information there about that symposium, sign up, 
Uh, and uh, there's a lot going on in that four day period. Going along with that, Code Jumper is our block coding solution uh, using sound to help with basic concepts of block coding and to teach that. A number of lessons that are available to help with those specific concepts. Go to codejumper.com. You can find out all the information about that. We've had some webinars recently about Code Jumper. We have a few coming up in May, so stay tuned to those same emails that told you about this webinar. You can find out about those webinars and plenty of other ones coming up in the next several weeks on all sorts of different topics. Code Jumper is available on quota $795 or non-quota for $999. So thank you very much for giving us this webinar, William. Uh, if we have any more questions, we'll try to deal with those real quickly as we wrap up. 